We want to welcome you to Women 31. Uh, today we have our special guest, <coughs> Kay Kaiser, with us. And uh, just a little bit about how I met Kay Kaiser. Um, it was actually uh, ordained by God. I was at a uh, healing school ordination service in um, Houston, Texas, Tom Ball, with uh, Joan Hunter Ministries. And another sister of mine, at the time, she was just an acquaintance, but later in life, she would be a, uh, she would become a sister of mine mm -hmm. and also a great leader in my life. And so she reached out to me on Facebook because she saw that I was uh, filming the worship, praise and worship that we were having there for the service. And she said, uh, I have a friend by the name of Kay Kaiser. And she said, uh, it would be wise for you to reach out to her. Well, like I said, she was an acquaintance at the time. Her name is Valerie. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know her very well. And so I thought, well, there's like 100 people here because there really was 100 mm -hmm. people there. And it was during COVID. So some of them were wearing masks. And I didn't know what Kay looked like. I didn't know anything. And so, you know, when someone asks you to do something that's kind of strange and you think about, well, what am I even going to say? Yeah. You know, I don't know this person very well. And I definitely don't know Kay, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but praise God when you listen and you're just obedient and do it, right? So, um, because you never know what God is going to do through that connection, through that moment, right? So, um, I started looking for Kay, and I think it was the next day that I finally located her. And so I approached her, and I told her uh, why I was reaching out to her. And so we didn't really um, connect at that moment, but we exchanged information. And every now and then we would text each other, but nothing really significant had mm -hmm. happened yet, right? But we did uh, graduate from the healing school with Joan Hunter Ministries, and we both got ordained on the same day as well. And this was uh, June of 2020. And so uh, years later, we would come to find out that we were in the same ministry with... Um, the acquaintance, Valerie at the time, which would become my leader in that ministry. And then from there, um, but it would be Gloria that would introduce me to that ministry. So again, there was a series of, when the Lord tells you to do something, even if it seems like it's so insignificant or it's out of your comfort zone, right? Because none of us like to be out of our comfort zone but you just do it and watch and see what God will do. As in this case here with Gloria and with Kay. Uh, so with Kay, it would be meeting her there. And then years later, I guess it was in 2022. That's when I would find out that we were in the same ministry with CWR. And then, um, <clears throat> After that, she would start uh, an anthology, which she's going to talk about. She would be a visionary author for that, and then I would become an author for that as well. And then from that, it would grow three volumes later into a ministry, which is in its baby steps right now. Mm -hmm. So here is my sister, <laughs> Kay Kaiser. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, I love when Melissa shares um, about how the Lord, I'm going to say how he connects the dots. And um, I love the fact also that Gloria is the one who actually reached out to me and was telling me about being a part of, or just starting writing um, chapters in a book and it's called Return to Me, My Scars Are Healed. And of course, Gloria's, her chapter's in that book as well. So um, I just, like I said, I just love how the Lord does things. Um, of course, I've attended 
the CWR retreats and um, for the women veterans. And um, I just, I don't know, I'm just in awe, you know, with the Father, how he does things. Um, I am really happy to be here to be able to share um, even my my story, you know, about um, just life growing up. And I'm going to say without Christ, because I was born into the foster care system, which means I, I actually start my story from in my mother's womb, because she had decided that she was not going to parent me. And she chose um, to do so by listening to older siblings and she kept it real secret. She only told like three sisters. The rest of the, her siblings had no idea. Her parents didn't know. She was just really gonna keep it quiet. And so um, I, I took time to actually start my story from inside the womb. And I, I'm going to actually read a portion of my story because um, like I said, this I wouldn't have a chapter in this book Honestly, if Gloria would have never reached out to me, I would have never pursued writing, never. So we really do have to pay attention to who's in our ear gates because that was just through messaging. She didn't call me, but she sent out a message. It's almost like taking your fishing rod and it's got the worm on it because I, I have a five-year-old great a grandson that I actually go fishing with. And he always has me put the worm on because it's like, ah, they're wiggling, you know, <laughs> like he don't want to, and he don't want to catch the fish either once he catches one. It's kind of like, okay, what's this? What, this is fishing. But that's what Gloria did for me is by putting that worm on, casting it out. And of course, she didn't know how it was going to respond. You know, we never do, but we still need to go ahead and put that out there. And now I, I would honestly say because Gloria took time. Apparently she saw something in me that I didn't see because I never saw myself as an author. So I'm going to read just a portion of this. The chapter, I started it out. I didn't even know what to title it when I was getting ready to write, but I titled it Overcomer. So again, the name of the book is Return to Me. My Scars Are Healed. The visionary author is Cindy Ann Rogers. And of course, I love, you know, I don't know how she came up with this beautiful cover, but it's really amazing. She put all of our names on the front. So I start out with saying, I am an overcomer. I know that you are asking, what is an overcomer? The definition, a person who, co who overcomes something, one who succeeds in dealing with or gaining control of some problem or difficulty. According to God's word, an overcomer is a person who defeats someone or something in a conflict or a struggle. A scripture that I lean on about overcoming is Joshua 1.9. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I think about how my mother must have felt when she learned that she was pregnant. She was a 19-year-old university student who was going to school on a scholarship and was literally um, dismayed about learning this unwelcoming news. Before legalized abortion in the U.S., teen pregnancy was definitely a no-no and had to be kept secret. In the 1960s, and I was born in 61, Expectant mothers lost their jobs and could no longer attend school if their news got out in the community where they lived. Time has definitely changed. The Supreme Court's landmark decision on June 24, 2022 is a beautiful blessing to many, especially to all the unborn babies, and not so much um, to others. Many young mothers who were often sent away to homes to hide from the veil of shame during the latter months of their pregnancy. Well, that is what occurred with my birth mother. She shared her news with three of her older sisters and the decision was made and off she went. I wondered what story she told everyone when she came back to her community. 
Like, every, you know, everyone was wondering, like, okay, you've been gone all these months. Where were you? Okay, and uh, let her family members who wondered where she had been all those months. So I grew up in those foster homes, and I experienced many life traumas the children should have not, that children should not bump into. Sexual abuse from older foster children in the home, extreme physical beatings, emotional beatdowns, incarcerated in my bedroom daily, negative words spoken into my ear gates, adult caregivers talking to me in a demeaning way, in secret but loud enough for me to hear. Uh, um, I'm, I apologize. Okay, um, the Cinderella syndrome abuse. And I wrote in here, yes, it really is a real syndrome. This is where one child in the family is singled out and abused by the other children in the home. You know, they have that freedom to go and do what they want to do, but there's one in the house that is um, that it receives all of that, that harm. The chores were only given to me and they all had to be done perfectly. That was the toxicity that I grew up with and I did not hear the sound, the words that I would hope children of today should hear often, which are, I love you. Hugs were not given out or pats on the back with words such as well done said to me. As I look back at my life, I always wonder why I was never introduced to Yeshua, who is Christ the Anointed One, as a child. We all know that the ideal time to share Jesus with children is when they're young um, and receptive to what we teach them. Parents and caregivers are the first teachers that is why Christ says in Proverbs 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way that they should go. And when he is old, they will not depart from it. Yes, that includes all adult caregivers, foster parents, grandparents. I wrote Sabbath keeper, Sabbath keeper, keeper teachers, parochial school teachers, etc. I did not receive a Bible until I went to church camp at a summer of 1978 when I was invited by a young lady whose family who had just moved into town. Her father was a pastor, she was a sophomore, and I was a freshman in high school. And I actually watched her one day as she was going to her locker and I noticed that there was something different about her than all the other high school students. I, knew, I know now that she had the spirit of the living God all over her. It was like it was spilling out. Like a city on a hill, the light of Christ was very radiant in her. Well, because of our friendship, I was um, introduced to Christ. They took me to the, a week-long camp meeting, and it didn't end there. They picked me up every Sunday to take me to church. During the camp meeting, the family and I met a man who connected with, with us as we enjoyed freshly prepared meals each day. As he sat at our meal table daily, I learned more about him and his family as he spoke about the relationship with Christ as a child. As the week was coming to an end, he presented me with a brand new Bible, and the Bible was in a, like in a box to the point to where I had to like open it up and pull the Bible out and my very first one. It was just really, really exciting. I mean, I can still see that in my head. I said, um, a Bible, wow. I was in awe and still am as I write these words. And as these happy memories flood my thoughts, I proudly took the Bible with me each Sunday. Once we returned home, my high school friend's family was faithful to pick me up every Sunday and take me to church. I still have no idea why the family that I lived with never took me or re reassured me that they would take me to church. Since the good seeds had been planted, what would have even been better than this? Like, go with me. You know, like, don't 
take your children to church, but go with them. So after I graduated from high school, the only advice that I was given was to just get a full-time job, and I was never encouraged to go to college and to pursue a career. So I did work a full-time job. I actually worked more than one and chose to become a wife and still didn't have a real relationship with Christ. I was just going through the motions because no one shared with me life tips on how to be a wife. And that, that marriage actually turned into divorce because I didn't know how to be a wife. I had no idea. My failed relationship occurred because I had never had a true family relationship as a child. It all starts at the beginning of our lives. We must nurture and care for the young people in our lives, whether they are blood relations or as a forever slash relative caregiver. Children all over the world need love. God is love. Love those who are in your circle of life. Affirm them. 1 John 4, 16, God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Something that I have learned in hindsight through all the moves in the foster care system is that God truly was with me. Even as an adult now, I wonder where he was and why he didn't stop all this mishandling of my precious life by all these so-called adult caregivers and predatory foster children. Remember, I was born into the foster care system abandoned, rejected, and invaluable in my birth mother's womb, and also an afterbirth. I still have a hard time wrapping those thoughts around in my mind. I know that I'm not an accident. My Heavenly Father does not make mistakes. All lives have value. Yeshua died for each one of us. And then I wrote after that, Lord help me, Lord help us. One of the things that I am grateful and thankful for is overcoming illness and disease that Yeshua has healed me of. I was making plans to become a licensed ordained minister and shortly afterwards learning about the diagnosis that pursuit was placed on hold for three years. So you are going to be met anyway, no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. I was diagnosed with mixed connective tissue disease in June of 2017, which is lupus, scleroderma, and myositis. I had no idea what was going on with my body. I noticed that my skin was turning a darker brown and it became thicker than normal. My face had several areas transformed into a person who had vitiligo, a creamy color pigment. Then the myositis kicked in and I gradually lost my ability to walk. I knew that it was serious when I would sit and had no ability to pull myself back up. I was blessed to have people on both sides of me to brace, brace me as I would stand straight up. One day, um, as I was walking out the door to get into my car, I apparently fell into the grass. There was a gentleman who actually walked over to me and um, he would just say, ma'am, are you okay? When there I am just laying there, not even, didn't even have the ability to get back up. He helped me up and I proceeded to walk to my car. I got into the car, placed the key in the ignition. Guess what? I didn't even have strength in this thumb or this finger to turn the ignition. That's how much muscle mass I had lost. So I just had to sit there for, you know, a few moments just to kind of figure out how am I going to do this? Oh, goodness. Um, I said to myself, is this real? You know, like when something like in life happens like that and you're wondering like, is this for real? Is this really happening to me? The disease was so debilitating that I could not believe that this was really my life. The strength in my body was fading away due, the, to, due to the loss of muscle mass. I was losing muscle and losing a lot of weight. I was close to 160 pounds when I was initially diagnosed and ended up at 126 pounds by December of that same year. 
I was using a cane and had to start using a walker. My body was really weak. I learned that I went through the journey. Doctors truly are practicing, and I put that in parentheses, you know, the quotation marks. No matter what specialist I went to, they had no idea how to correct the problem that was physically, that I was physically encountering. I was baffled. I even did some research on Google and primarily learned that people who were experienced this disease died within a certain amount of time after being diagnosed. Remember, I am an overcomer, and so are you. I did learn that I did not have to take the prescribed medicines by the practicing doctors. I started reading books about lupus, medical art articles about the disease and how often had overcome it. I knew that I wanted to join that group. I started to eat a plant-based diet, which I learned that according to Genesis 2.8, now the Lord God had planted a garden in the, in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of, that grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In verse 15, it says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and to take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. So when I reread this passage, I realized that everything that Adam needed was in that garden. Not in a pharmacy and not in the meat market. There was no animals to eat. So my mindset changed and I looked for every holistic route to take and did away with what doctors prescribed. I have given Yeshua my whole life and I know that many people are not, uh, may not understand my way of thinking. It was not a mistake for me to go through what I experienced. I'm not going to say that I liked it or that I encourage it. I have forgiven every person who has mishandled me, gossiped about me, spoke ill about me, or abused me in some form or fashion. I love my daddy God. He is a wonderful father. I have three children. Two are, two are biological, and one was added to our family through the gift of adoption. She was born into the foster care system like me. I know they probably don't understand my ways, and they definitely didn't know my story, but they do now. Hopefully, as they read this testimony, it will help them. In Acts 1, verse 22, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. My life experience in foster care has helped me to learn how I can help those who are currently walking the foster care journey. Kay's Carry On was born at a retreat, which is a nonprofit organization. I was blessed to attend a Veterans Women Retreat in Galveston, Texas during Veterans Day 2018. While I was there enjoying all of the activities that were planned, I was um, one of the people who had the opportunity to receive counseling each day that I was there. On day three, isn't that when the Lord does things? Day three, the topic of my childhood was brought up. We all have one, and I definitely did not want to talk about it, but I slid into the conversation gingerly. And I was unsure if I wanted to share such trauma with an individual that I did not know and really didn't know if she even cared. I shared the story of being a victim to older children in one of the homes that I lived in. My foster mother's favorite nephew was a pedophile and would touch me in the off-limit areas of my nine to ten-year-old body every chance he had. He would also stand be before me and rub his sexual organ on me. I had no one to tell this to. Who would believe me anyway? 
The undercover abuse went on for many years. And I wrote in here, stop, think for a moment about how many people are still carrying this baggage. Psalm 17:3, it says, He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. After sharing what I could through all the crying, the creative idea of Yeshua came into my mind about giving foster children brand new rolling luggage so they would not have to secure their personal items in a trash bag. So when children are removed from their family of origin, dad, mom, grandmother, whoever it is that they're living with, unfortunately, their items are placed in a trash bag. And children, they view that, they see that, and then they start thinking that I must be trash. So this, the majority of my childhood, and even, I mean, I'm 62 years old, it's, I've had a hard time getting over the trash bag issue, um, just knowing that that's just not how we, that's not how we travel, you know. Oh, let's see. Yeshua came to my mind about giving foster children rolling luggage so they would be able to secure their personal items as they are removed from foster home to foster home. Some children are in residential facilities and juvenile detention centers, and they all need the security of their items as well. And trash bags are a horrible idea. I'm not sure who came up with that idea, but none of us travel with trash bags even if they are scented and beautiful pastel color. It's just not good. It's actually demeaning. That is why I started Case Carry On. And of course I wrote in here about how you can find my information. Um, this is what Miss, this sweet lady just spoke about a moment ago. Um, I wrote in here about how I am an overcomer, right? On June 6, 2020, Yes, during the pandemic. I graduated from Joan Hunter Ministries Ordination School located in Tomball, Texas. I was assisted up the steps to walk across the stage to receive my certificate from Joan Hunter and took a photo with her as well. I was cheered by the already ordained ministers. They knew my struggles and my successes. My Heavenly Father has a sense of humor because He allows me to grow up without having a relationship with Him and then He blesses me to become a minister. So I say He has a sense of humor. <laughs> oh my goodness, yes, He allows me to minister His gospel. I am another, um, I'm an overcomer once again. For the family that suggested that I just get a full-time job, and, um, you know, sock the idea of getting a college education. On May 5th, 2004, I attended my own co college graduation from Southeast Missouri State University with a bachelor's degree in human environmental studies with a minor in social work. There was no one in the audience who knew me. I went to satisfy myself as an overcomer. And at that time, I was in the process of adopting my daughter. She was um, not even two years old. And I asked a friend of mine, I said, will you take care of her so I can go walk across the stage? But like I said, there was no one in the audience. I, it didn't even matter because what it was is I was overcoming the fact of I had individuals that were in my ear gates telling me, oh, well, just go get a full-time job. Education's not important. You don't need that. And even since then, October 2023, I graduated with my doctorate degree. So I'm excited about that too. So I just kept on going when it came to, when it came to education. Yes, yes, yes. So um, I just say thank you. Huh? Dr. K. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you, Yeshua, for changing my life. A mess that turned into a message and a mission. I am overwhelmed by his divine favor and unconditional love. He shows up in my life daily. Daily he loads me with benefits. That's in Psalm 68:19. He has also shown me in Psalm 
chapter 8, verse 11, that there is no good thing that he would withhold from those who walk uprightly. Thank you, Abba Father, for every good gift that comes from heaven above. How could you love me so well? Why did you love me? Thank you for singing over me. I love you, Abba Father, with my whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then the prayer that I put back here is, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 34, 18. The glory of the Lord is in my DNA. May Jesus be glorified on the earth. And the reason that I really, it was really important to me to read this to you is because we all have a story. And for a while there, the Lord had me going and looking at graveyards. It's kind of like, what does that mean? <laughs> well, what he was really saying is that all of those people died. They all had a story. They didn't choose to write it. And I am glad that I had the opportunity to write because I feel like without Gloria's um, invitation to write, I feel like I would still be carrying this around in my heart, which means I still would be like sick in my heart because I'm still carrying that around. It's like it was time to release it. And it was very difficult to even understand how to start my story. Because I have people walk up to me now and say, where do I begin? <laughs> Mine, I was able to go all the way back to the womb and realize like, wow, my mom, you know, she learned that she was pregnant. What do I do with this baby? And so, um, and she never ever told my dad. Um, I found him when I was 40. I found her when I was 36. And so um, apparently, I don't even know what story, um, I don't think she ever told him a story. But um, the beautiful thing about all of this also is that um, I took a chance on searching for my birth family because I wanted to know who they are. And a lot, some adoptees or whatever, they are children that age out of the foster care system. They don't necessarily want to know. I, my daughter's 22, she could care less who her mother is. I mean, she has her phone, her, her mom's phone number and all of that, but she said, well, I grew up with you. You know, like, who is she? You know, like, that's a stranger to me. So she won't even connect with her. But there was something in me where I wanted to know. Like, I look in the mirror, like, who do I look like? Who am I, you know? Not all children have that desire, but I took time and did some search and there was an intermediary that I was uh, a court intermediary in the state of Michigan and she was appointed to help me to locate her and so she called me and said oh I located your mom and I thought wow like okay and she says well um she's gonna call you on Friday now this was on a Monday so when Friday came y'all can't even imagine what that felt like. I mean, I even put my boys somewhere quiet, you know, just so I could enjoy the, my conversation. But I carried that phone around, and at that time we had ha handheld phones, right? Not cell phones. It was just the normal, you know, you stick it on the, what do you call those? <laughs> the yeah, the receivers, yeah. You just lay it there, <laughs> let it charge. And I think at that time it was a big deal to have a phone that was like that because everyone else had the the corded ones. So if you had something like that, you were really moving up, you know, in life. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that particular day, when I got off work, I remember going and picking the phone up because there was a, a time that she was going to call. And so it's like I didn't want to do any chores or anything. I just wanted to carry the phone. <laughs> and that's, that's what I did, you know, until the phone rang. And then I, I was standing outside just so that I could because I'm an outdoor person anyway, so I just said, well, I'm just going to stand outside and enjoy our conversation. And it was very nice. She took time to, um, on the phone, she didn't talk about, you know, why she gave me away or anything like that. But we did set it up to where I was going to fly to Las Vegas, Nevada 
which is where she was living at the time. And in one of my chapters um, with Cindy Rogers, I actually write about Memorial Day because I met her on Memorial Day. And then when it was time for me to meet my biological dad, I met him on Memorial Day. And I kept wondering like, Lord, what is the chapter? What's the, what is the title to my chapter? And he just brought it to me like immediately, Memorial Day. Wow. So it's like, wow, this is amazing. So I did fly to Las Vegas and I spent a weekend with her. And um, she was dealing with an autoimmune as well. She didn't really go into detail about it. Um, and prior to me flying back to Houston, because I was living in Humble, Texas at that time, and I remember sitting at her little bar, because she had prepared breakfast for me, and I said to her, and I don't even know where these words came from, but I said, I'm missing you, and I haven't even left yet. I don't even, I still, I mean, I know what it means now, because after I left, I, of course, I had that time between Memorial Day up to her passing, and she passed my birthday month, which is October. Prior to October, prior to that year, I never celebrated my birthday. I didn't have birthday parties anyway. Most foster kids don't have birthday parties, so it's not like it's a big deal. But once meeting her, it's like it there were some connections like, okay, I do have a birthday. I do have a birth mom, you know, and then of course I was blessed to meet my birth father. And that was pretty phenomenal as well because he was, he learned through the court system that I was his daughter. Um, apparently they gave him the information, I guess, over the phone, which to me is kind of odd. And then what he did, um, and what I did prior to meeting him is I took time to write a letter because I had went to the archives department at Western Michigan University and got that address and I took a chance and I wrote the letter and I, in my mind I'm saying who lives at the same address since the 1950s or whatever I said this letter's going to come back like why am I even going through the motion. Well, I laid it on the kitchen table, left it there for a couple of weeks, and I told the Lord at that time, I said, you know what, I'm just gonna take a chance. You know, like, just drop it in the mail. If it comes back, it comes back. Well, it didn't come back. He had actually rented out the homes, and his, um, the renters actually called him and said, John, you got a piece of mail here. And my dad, of course, was wondering, like, okay, who wrote me? So he, he lived in, um, near Lansing, and he had to drive all the way down, a couple of hour drive, actually, to go pick up the mail. Picked it up, got the mail, and then a day, I, I think a few days after he read it, and he verified that I was his daughter, then he called my workplace, and he left a message on my voicemail. Now, you, I'm going to tell you, when you get a phone call like that, all I knew to do, and he left the message, which means I wasn't at the desk to be able to collect the call. And I just played that button. You know, at that time, you could just press a button, and you could replay. So I just replayed it, and replayed it, and replayed it. And I said, wow, this is, this is the man that I took a chance and mailed the letter. And then here it is, all of a sudden, he wants me to come and be with them for Memorial Day. <laughs> and I showed up, and it was nighttime, and it was just interesting. I had my daughter and granddaughter with me at the time, and I remember he wanted to make sure that I could locate him. So he went out into the, his driveway, turned his headlights on and just flashed them, you know. So like when I drove, it's like, oh, that's the house right there. Oh my goodness. Um, I don't know who was more um, overwhelmed and just in awe. You know, I can't compare his emotions and mine, but he was determined, you know, that he was going to 
meet this daughter. So, oh my goodness. Um, I just love how the Lord um, has a way of connecting families. Um, and I believe because I was pursuing the Lord and he knew what was on my heart. And I wasn't even a 100% follower of Christ at that time. But the Lord was still, um, he was a part of me. Um, and I pursued him, was pursuing him. But I just love how he just took time to say, okay, well, you want to connect with your family? I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to make it happen. And um, I'm trying to do the same thing with my 22-year-old, but I'm just leaving that alone because we all are different. We all know, like she knows her, who her biological mom is. If she wants to go that direction, she's welcome. I remember when I was at the hospital and I was going and I was getting ready to bring my daughter home, I stood in front of her mother and I said, when um, my daughter gets to be a certain age, you know, is it okay for her to reach out to you? Because I had a wonderful experience, so I wanted for the, her to have the same. And so um, the lady, her, her mom said, yes, she's welcome to reach out to me, but my daughter's not ready for that yet. So that's one of the, like I said, I just love how the Lord um, ordains everything. I mean, even for us to be in this room together, and I live, you know, in Northeast, uh, Florida, but the God of heaven, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob still puts us in the room together, and we're wondering, like, how does that happen? And every t and I've done a God moment with this sweet lady, and even sitting on the side of her, even now, I'm still in awe, you know, with how he did that. Like, Lord, like, how do you sit up there in heaven and, and you know, beeline us, you know, to where we're going to meet? Because we didn't know. Even on the day that we were being ordained, did we know? I mean, we had no idea, but the Lord knew, and he knew what we would be doing together. So I guess that's why we were ordained on the same day, because we're still doing things <laughs> together, which is just, I'm really in awe. So, Share how you became an author for The Faces of Foster. Oh, yes, yes, yes. This is volume two, but volume one, this tells you this will help you to understand that when we go to the Father sincerely and if there's something deep in our heart that we want, um, the Lord will do it. He says that there's no good thing that he would withhold from those who walk uprightly. I always think about the scripture that says um, daily he loads us with benefits. I don't know whether or not we ask for those benefits, but I do. Because um, I said, if he daily he gives them to us, daily I want them. <laughs> so on the day, I, there was a, I was in the state of Missouri, actually, and I was getting ready to just go outside. And um, I had time. The sun was shining, and I just remember looking up through some um, trees, and I seen the sun, the rays of the sun. And I kept thinking about how I had wrote this with Cindy. And um, of course, I always continue to think about um, Miss Gloria, and um, I'm trying to see who else is on this one. Sheila, yes. Uh -huh. um, and of course, Miss Cindy is the visionary author. But I had not only wrote in this one, but every time Cindy came out with a new one, it was always titled Unexpected Blessings. And so I participated in each one of those projects and then of course we haven't um, submitted a chapter yet for the next one but that one's going to be unexpected blessings because he lives well I told the Lord on that particular day um, I went outside looked up to the heavens and I this this lets you know just how powerful our words are too that we have to really pay attention like we cannot just there's a scripture that talks about how we're going to be held accountable for what we speak and what we say. The Lord's not kidding when he says that. Oh my. I mean, <laughs> he's not kidding. I've actually went back and repented for things that I've said that should not have been said. But when I went outside, I told the Lord, 
I said, Father, I've been writing all of my chapters for um, Cindy Rogers, our publisher. And I just said these words real mildly, like, may I have my own anthology. And I said, it only focuses on foster care, which means I don't have every author come in. Miss Cindy, she can have everybody because there's not, she doesn't have a, a population that she's focusing on. Well, I wanted to know who was in foster care. Like, okay, I'm asking you this hard thing. I'm asking. But I knew that the Lord knew who, who grew up in foster care. And of course, I'm gonna let Miss Melissa share a piece also because she helped me to understand how really all this got going. And it was from the publisher reaching out to, um, to you, correct? It was a post. There okay. was a post that was shared on Facebook that said they were looking for um, authors that had been in foster care. And I wasn't sure what exactly they were looking for because I was in the foster care system. I lived in uh, five different placements, uh, children's homes and um, short-term placements. And so I don't have a pretty story and I didn't know what they were looking for. So I responded on the post and asked, you know, if you're looking for, uh, you know, what exactly are you looking for? And once they responded, then I said yes, you know, that I would be part of it because they said they wanted real life stories. Mm -hmm. They didn't want just pretty stories. They wanted the truth. The good, the bad, and the ugly. So I, um, from there, I reached out to someone that I know, uh, Rosalind Ryder in San Antonio, and I had met her through the CWR ministry. And I asked if she had anybody that was in foster care that would like to write their stories. And so she connected me with two others. I spoke with them and they decided to write and then Miss Rosalind decided to write as well. So you see how God connects you with one person and then there's, there's an assignment with that person. Right. There's a mission, there's uh, something that the Lord wants to do through you know, each of you, right? Mm -hmm. So so true, yes. Well, I just thought it was interesting how when I just said that real short prayer about may I, and I went to him as you would go to a parent and you would say, may I have a piece of candy or may I have a cookie or whatever it is that you're asking for. And I believe because of the way that I approached him, I guess he said, oh, sure, daughter. <laughs> you want that? Okay. And then after that, it's like, wow, what do I do now? Because I don't know anybody in the foster care system. So he granted me my request, but it's kind of like, what do I do next? But of course, like I, Melissa shared, you know, how all that got going. What's interesting is that we not only had a volume one, but we had a two and a volume three. And now we're working on volume four. Praise God. So, yes. So I'm just in awe with uh, the connections that the Lord has brought. And um, of course, many of those authors are dealing with, um, even as adults, they're still dealing with their childhood. You know, they're still carrying that around, even though they've wrote their chapter, which is not enough. I mean, we can all write, but just there's something that goes along with it. You know, there's some deliverance that needs to go with it. So, and I believe the enemy um, he, his goal is, yeah, go ahead and write your story as long as you don't get delivered. You know, like continue to walk in that um, zombie mode if you like. But um, no, we want more for the authors. So we're planning to have a um, author's retreat at um, Prayer Mountain. Of course, she can tell you more about it because she's been there. <laughs> Well, that's for another testimony because there's more that's in the baking. But um, I just, I love the fact of how the Lord has blessed Kay in so many areas of her life. Um, and she has childlike faith, you know, just 
Daddy, may I have my own anthology? And then he gives it to her. And it's not just that, but there's numerous things that we get together and pray about and you see the fruit of it. You know, so if anything, we just hope that y'all, uh, that that encourages you, mm -hmm. you know. You, there's no fancy words, there's no, you know, specific way, you know, just simply ask. So true. You know, if it's going to uh, bless the kingdom, Amen. he'll give it to you. Amen. You know, and just like she said, you know, well, what do I do now? Okay, you gave it to me, but I don't know anybody. Well, how this, how that? He brings other people. He already has other people waiting yes. to be yes. a blessing to you. But it takes you to take that first step. Yes. And so. what's beautiful about the books is that um, our author, I mean, not our author, our um, publisher, she was raised by her grandparents. And so there's many authors that were raised by relatives or, you know, foster families. And so I told her that she qualified. For a long time she said, oh no, I'm not gonna write. I don't, qual I wasn't a foster child. But you weren't, you didn't grow up with your parents. So you qualify. And once she, I think it started to really sink in, she's going like, right, that's true. Yes, I'm gonna write. So in volume three, she actually did our foreword. And she wrote about, you know, a little portion of what her life was like. And I was so appreciative of that because when you have a publisher that's already connected, in a sense, to foster care, you know, of course she jumped on board and said, yes, I'm going to help you to get these anthologies out. And she continues to do so. So I'm, th I'm thanking the Lord for Miss Cindy. I, I pray for her all the time because she's always doing great things for us. And I just recently ordered some shirts like this that actually say no more trash bags. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of people have said, where you got, where did you get those from? But I'm just tired of foster children um, dealing with trash bags. I love delivering brand new luggage to children. I actually, with me living in Florida, I went to Houston um, in the month of May when some students were graduating from high school. And, um, they were not only graduating, which of course that's a success all by itself, but they were aging out of the foster care system. So, you know, that's like a double whammy, you know, in a sense. Um, and so um, when, when I get donations, um, uh, many people just go online and do their donations, but that's what the money goes towards is purchasing the brand new luggage and making sure that they have um, the ones that are aging out, they get like um, a coffee maker, a crock pot, you know, just some small kitchen appliances. Um, one of the things that I did, um, I didn't have to worry about an apartment because I joined the Army. But one of the reasons I hopped over into that life is because I knew that they were going to house me, they were going to feed me. I wasn't going to lack for anything. You know, my clothes were going to be clean, all of those things. So that's not necessarily, I'm going to say, a good route. <laughs> but it worked for me at that time. So, um, and I, one of the things I loved about joining the military is that they did not give me a trash bag. They actually gave me a duffel bag. And everything was folded and packed in that duffel bag properly. And it was, it was not a trash bag. So the, the military has got to up on when it comes to, in regards to the foster care system. So, so that is what I wanted to share with you all tonight. Just, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.